Good evening and welcome to our lecture tonight. I'm Wendy Winterstein. I serve as the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. It's my pleasure tonight to tell you a little bit about Dr. Mike Bolge. He is a distinguished professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics and the Center for Food and Agricultural Business at Purdue University. He has devoted his career to helping farm and ag business managers and policymakers understand the pragmatic, economic, and financial consequences of their decisions. A major theme of his work is the importance of strategic planning, thinking, and positioning for long-term viability and success. Dr. Bolge is an ISU alum. He received his BS in Ag Economics in 1965. He previously served on the Iowa State University Economics faculty and as an assistant director of the Iowa Agriculture Experiment Station and assistant dean for the College of Agriculture. He has also held faculty positions, uh, administrative positions at the University of Minnesota and Oklahoma State University. He is author or co-author of four books and more than 450 articles and publications. He is a fellow of the Agricultural, Agricultural and Applied Economics Association and the International Food and Ag Business Management Association. Help me welcome Dr. Mike Bolge. Well, thank you very much. It, uh, it is a humbling uh, opportunity for me to be here on the Iowa State campus and, and have this uh, chance to visit with you about some of the challenges and opportunities we see in the agricultural industry. But before I do that, I do want to uh, uh, at least share with you a little bit about how mm -hmm. Iowa State University shaped my career. Uh, and I was telling Wendy that I just decided to kind of sit down and make a list of the people that I had the chance to learn from, to work with, to collaborate with here at uh, Iowa State. And when I got to 30 and was still going, I decided, can't go there, can't name 30 names, okay? That'll be the whole evening. So uh, what I'd like to do is just name a couple of people that really were very impactive in terms of my career that are people that you may or may not recognize. And one of them is uh, uh, the late Dr. Raymond Beneke. Uh, Raymond Beneke was my advisor as an undergraduate, okay? Uh, he and uh, uh, others in the Department of Economics were basically telling me that uh, maybe I should consider graduate school. And I hadn't really thought about graduate school at all. And uh, Ray um, uh, was a Minnesota graduate, and so he talked to his people and friends in Minnesota. Uh, he was disappointed that I chose not to go to Minnesota, that I instead chose to go to Purdue. But uh, he and J.T. Scott were really, really very impactive on me when I was an undergraduate. I had the chance to come back here on the faculty, and uh, Ray Beneke was the one that convinced me to come back, actually, because he was the department head yet at that time to come back and join the faculty here. Had the chance when I was here to work with, uh, with a number of people that I'll always remember working with, uh, people you'll recognize. Uh, enjoyed the chance to work with Neil Harrell. Uh, we did a lot of work together. Uh, actually, uh, 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 we'll talk a little bit about it in the, in the presentation. About this time of year, back in the 1980s, we had a, a team that was working the financial stress of the 80s. And, Neil Harrell and Bob Jolly uh, were two of the people that uh, did a lot of work with at that time, uh, very much enjoyed. Had a chance to uh, work in the Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, was actually the director of that for a while after Earl Hetty's accident. Uh, and then uh, really did enjoy the opportunity that uh, then Dean Lee Colmer provided for me to, uh, to spend some time at administration in there. Uh, uh, Louis Thompson, uh, the late John Malstead, uh, Lee Colmer, uh, again, very impactive in terms of my career. Uh, I left Iowa State to be an administrator at, uh, at uh, Minnesota, and after doing that for another five years, decided that really the best position to have in a university is a senior professor, and uh, so I went to Purdue as a senior professor and have been there since 1992, but Iowa State did shape a lot of what I do today in terms of, of thinking about how to work with 
producer groups, how to work with agribusiness companies, how to work with people helping them think about, as was indicated, strategic positioning uh, in how to uh, position for uh, both the good times as well as the more challenging times. And that's what we really need to talk about this evening, is how do we think about positioning ourselves given that we have these challenging times that we have in this industry. So what I want to do is I want to kind of do two things. Number one is I want to talk about what is shaping the landscape of the agricultural industry, both today, but as we think about it over the next 10, 15, 20 years. You can't talk about this without talking about where we are today, okay? But we don't want to focus our intention or our attention completely on uh, the tough times that the overall economy and that parts of agriculture are in today. We want to talk about the opportunity side of this. And let me remind you that uh, in any turbulent time, uh, there is, along with the risk associated with that, there is opportunity, and there will be real opportunities out of this turbulent time as well. So we're going to talk about these forces that are shaping the agricultural industry, how they're shaping the agricultural industry, in my judgment, and then we're going to talk about what they mean in terms of challenges and opportunities, particularly focused on the production sector. Now, I, I, I would tell you that uh, when I was called, uh, when, when he called me to do this, I said, do you want a research seminar and, and presentation or do you want a uh, more of an extension outreach engagement presentation? And, and she said, well, I think really given the audience, it would be probably more appropriate to kind of think about this in terms of an extension outreach engagement uh, presentation. So that's what you're going to hear. But let me just tell you that I am going to draw some conclusions that those of you who are researchers really ought to say, hmm, I think that's closer to a hypothesis, right? I'm not sure that's necessarily correct. And uh, I think there's probably, I don't know, 17, 20 research projects in this next hour's presentation that you could really think about, okay? So if you are research oriented, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff here that we don't have answers to. You're going to hear me say some things as though I think I know the answer, uh, but uh, I would have to argue that in almost all cases we need more analysis than sometimes we have in these areas. So here's the seven things that we're going to talk about in terms of the fundamental drivers, and then I'm going to talk about the challenges. Let's get into these drivers. You cannot talk about what's going on today in agriculture without talking about what's going on in the overall eco economy, okay? This economy is under severe financial stress. We all know that, uh, uh, emanating out of a lot of different causes, and we aren't going to go into the different causes of that. You can read about that in the various other venues. We won't spend time on that. What I want to talk about specifically is what's, what this all means for agriculture, okay? and not only for production agriculture, for agribusiness uh, firms as well. There are two fundamental implications of this financial stress in the overall economy that uh, we need to think about in agriculture. One is the one that we hear a lot of discussion about, and that is this issue of capital availability, and the classic, what we sometimes refer to as the freezing of the capital markets, okay? Now, as you can see from the bullets we have here, and we don't have time to go through all of them, that our perspective is that agriculture, and particularly production agriculture, is not nearly as severely impacted by this freezing of the capital markets compared to a lot of other industries. There are a number of industries, to be very frank, where uh, lenders uh, 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 just don't have the funds, let alone the appetite, to make a loan to that particular firm in that particular industry. Okay? This has generally not been a problem for agriculture in large part because agriculture sources its funds from different institutions than we get for the com uh, larger commercial businesses. Community banks, for example, have a fair amount of liquidity. They may have concerns about credit uh, worthiness of a customer. We'll come to that in a second. But in terms of funds availability, they haven't had the funds uh, 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 restrictions that we see in uh, a lot of the national and international banks. Uh, the farm credit system, which is another major lender in, to the agricultural sector, again, uh, has better access to the national and international capital markets than some other institutions, although uh, farm credit system has encountered difficulties in terms of, uh, of uh, basically issuing 10-year and longer-term debt. Uh, it's had to 
uh, uh, pay higher interest rates on those debts, and therefore it has higher cost of funds associated with that, and so it has been a somewhat of a challenge for them to position themselves competitively in the markets, okay, on longer-term funds. There are some other lenders, international lenders, and if you're interested in trying to borrow money on farmland, I'll tell you who they are privately, who are very, very competitive in this market today. Interest rates of 5.5%, okay? We work a lot with the lending community, and I can tell you there is 5.5% real estate money out there today, okay? Insurance companies and some commercial banks, international commercial banks. Their farm credit system has generally been uh, at rates of 7 and 7.5 seven and until recently when they found that they had to lower their rates to be competitive with what's going on in some of the other uh, institutions. Generally, however, that issue in agriculture with respect to the financial stress is not one of funds availability. It is this issue. We have a significant economic slowdown globally. Okay? It's not just a recession in the U.S. and a recession in Europe. Actually, IMF has come out, International uh, uh, Monetary Fund has come out with a new set of projections that indicate that almost every country, with the exceptions of China, will probably have either close to zero or negative economic growth in 2009. So this is uh, a, a recession of the order of magnitude that we have not seen for quite a while. But let me make sure you understand, we have been there before. We are still not as bad as we are in terms of the overall economy in the 1980s. Notice I didn't say the Depression. We're not even close to the Depression. Just to put it in context, in the Depression, we had a decline in the gross domestic product of this country by 25%. We had 25% unemployment. That's what a Depression is. Okay? We think that uh, we're going to probably end up in something like eight to nine. You, uh, the Fed came out with its forecast yesterday. They raised their, their unemployment numbers. They lowered their growth rate for the U.S. Uh, they still think we'll be able to get through to an economic recovery before we hit 10 percent unemployment. But that is not even as difficult as it was in the 1980s in terms of the overall economy, okay? So we need to be careful to not put this in the context of we're going back to a depression era. Is it difficult? Absolutely. Those that are employed, is it hard for them? Absolutely. But the overall economy is not as bad as it was during the 30s, and it still isn't as difficult as it is, was in the 1980s. Now, the, the key issue, and one of the things we're going to be kind to give you at least our judgment on, is when will this recovery occur, and so that you can put it in a context and you can change my prediction, because this is what I'm looking at, and so you can say, Bulgy was wrong, and that's not atypical. Most economists don't quite get it right. We're not particularly good at predicting, right? But what you want to do is you want to look at the drivers, okay? The fundamental driver that we need to be watching to help us understand how deep and how long this global recession will be is what happens in China. China now is growing at somewhere around 6.8, 6.9, a little short of 7% per year in terms of its uh, uh, GDP. That's down from 13% last year. Part of the high growth rate last year was, uh, was gearing up for the Olympics, it appears. But China has been growing at 10 to 12% per year for the last 20 years, okay? This is an economy that has been growing at three to four times the growth rate, certainly over a smaller, off a smaller base than we have had in Europe and the U.S., but a much higher growth rate than we've had uh, in, 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 in India, by the way, uh, has been growing as well at about 6%. Uh, we'll come back and talk to the population and the, and the importance of these countries in terms of that growth rate and what it means uh, in terms of food demand. The key issue is does China maintain its growth rate at something above 4, 3, 4, 5 percent. We're not worried about a recession in China. Uh, the reason we're not is because the Chinese have adequate financial reserves without borrowing a dime to be able to carry their economy with government expenditures probably for about 18 to 24 months, okay? So they have funny, plenty of financial capacity to weather uh, uh, an 18 to 24 month recession. But the issue is if this continues to go on longer and deeper, 
uh, China itself will possibly run out of money as well. So the question is what happens in China. If we have a slowdown in China getting into the 3 to 4 percent area, then this recession will probably extend on through into uh, uh, 2011, uh, uh, or certainly to 2010, maybe not 2011, but 2010. Everybody's hoping we'll get recovery by the end of this year. I'm not that optimistic. We will. Even if we do, it's going to be a slow recovery. It's not going to be a pop. And so uh, uh, the, the, the issue is what happens in China. That's important for agriculture because we have to find a replacement for the demand that will be maturing out from the energy market for the agricultural industry. We'll talk about that in a second. That demand historically has been, prior to ethanol, the animal protein demand in the rest of the world. And a, a big part of the rest of the world has been China, India, and Asia in general, in terms of growing demand. And so the question is, if China slows down sufficiently that they don't have enough income growth to continue to increase their animal protein consumption, what does that do then to the demand for agricultural products? And any demand for animal, animal products obviously has an impact back in terms of the grain markets as well. We say here costs adjust slowly, but that's maybe not quite as true as it used to be. We'll talk about that in a second. So fundamentally, the question in agriculture is one of a concern about margin compression due to the fact that we see economic growth slowing down, therefore demand growth slowing down, and our costs are not adjusting uh, as rapidly as they might. I have, I have here kind of the financial condition of the various industries. So I don't think uh, we want to spend time on that at this point. If you want copies of my PowerPoint slides, you're welcome. I'll be happy if you email me to, to provide them or I can make them available to you to provide if you want to put them on a website someplace. So the question that many people ask then is, okay, are you predicting or suggesting we're going back to the 1980s? Okay. Uh, and and, and I, I, I don't have time to develop that it's in full detail, but you can see again our perspective in terms of some key observations. Our answer to that question is no. We aren't going to have a 1980s phenomenon in agriculture where you saw a 50% decline in land values here in the state of Iowa uh, for lots of reasons. One is we are going into this period of time with low rates of inflation and low interest, so that is not a major driver of, 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 of the, the precipitous decline in asset values as well as decline in incomes that we said in the 1990s. We, we've actually come into this period with three years of record incomes in agriculture. So we've established at least some kind of liquidity at least for grain farmers, depending on what they did with those funds, unless they decided to buy a lot of new machinery, there's a lot of, of, of funds available for the typical operation. Better liquidity, little inflation investing behavior. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a lot of activity uh, that looked very much like the activity in the housing market of the last two years. Buying assets that were going up in value, even if you couldn't make the cash flow, and then when you couldn't make the payment, you'd refinance the land, monetize the capital gain, and hit it again. Uh, and just so you think about this, uh, if you think that those people out there in the housing market were irrational in this behavior, be careful because it might have been your father in the 1980s as a farmer, right? You'll have to be really careful because we have done that in agriculture, right? Now our debt load in agriculture, we learned our lesson. Our debt load in agriculture, we have only about a 10%, less than 10% debt to asset ratio in this industry. As an interesting contrast, by the way, Bear Stearns, the investment bank, when it uh, was bailed out, had a debt to asset ratio of 33 to 1, okay? 33 to 1. That's quite a leveraged position. That's part of the reason why that industry imploded in a matter of about three weeks is because it was highly leveraged and hot money financed, money borrowed overnight to do that, okay? So, so our expectation is we won't have the 1980s phenomenon, but let's be cautious. I didn't say we might not have some adjustments in asset values. Let me give you some numbers. My expectation is that we will see probably in the next 12 months somewhere around a 10% decline in asset values. I'd put an 80 plus percent probability on that prediction. 
uh, and there's evidence of that showing up already. The Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank just to release their survey of the quarterly uh, change in land values for uh, for Nebraska and the other states they represent, uh, Missouri, it was down, as I recall, 1% to 2%. Uh, the work we've done with uh, the banking industry indicates that northern Iowa, northern Illinois probably have somewhere around a 5% uh, to 10% decline already in land values. What, what, what is the best evidence of where this market's going is what happens in all these markets is what happens in the early phases of adjustment is activity goes to nothing. No transactions, a lot of no sales. Farmers National, one of the largest farm management companies in the, in the, in the, mid, in the Midwest, just uh, released in December information indicating that they had had a lot of no sale activity, in, uh, uh, particularly in the Western Corn Belt. Okay? I would not be surprised to see even as much as a 20% decline in land values over the next 24 months. Okay? I'm putting somewhere around a 40% probability on that. Okay? Now, let me also just warn you, though, that as a friend of mine told me recently when we did a program together, he said, well, what Bolsey just predicted to you if a 10% decline in land values is no change. The land market is so thin that if you really did the analysis, you would find that a statistic that a change of 5 to 10% up or down is really not statistically significantly different than zero. Okay? It's just so thin that we really don't know what's happening if we don't have changes either above or below those numbers. But I suspect that there's going to be very hard to see any kind of uptick in land values in this particular business climate, but not anything close to what we saw in the 1980s. Okay? I've got here a list of things that we learned from the 1980s because that's always the question that we get a lot, of, a lot of people asking right now. And so you can see some of the stuff that we learned in the 1980s, how we can position ourselves maybe to be successful in this in, uh, environment, importance of liquidity, uh, maintaining strong financial position, watch for opportunities. We'll return to that. There will be distressed assets that can be acquired. Uh, we'll have land rental uh, arrangements that are severed because of, 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 of landlords and tenants not having the same expectations of what the future looks like. So there will be opportunities to rent land that you never had the opportunity to rent for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, we uh, noticed there, hug your lender. Now's not the time to be trying to find a new lender that will give you another 50 basis points or a half percent reduction in rate. It's just not worth it, okay? Your lender that you've worked with through this period of time in the past is one you want to stick with right now. Position for the turnaround. And generally what we found, if you look at those that made it through the 80s and were successful and came out of the 80s and not only in a strong position but used the 80s phenomenon as a growth strategy, and there are some, but very successful at that, generally they were people who were too late, if you will, to the market rather than too early. Probably the classic example of somebody generally in the financial market that maybe is a little bit early is Warren Buffett's acquisition of Goldman Sachs in November. Uh, although Warren Buffett, uh, you all know Jimmy Buffett's uncle, right? Okay, <laughs> Warren Buffett. They are related, actually. Uh, uh, that's probably one of the few uh, errors he's made in, in his investing, okay? Be, or better to be late than to be early in these kinds of business climates in terms of making your moves, okay? Let's talk about energy a second. Now, in the state of Iowa, to talk about energy and ethanol, I probably ought to be cautious here, but I'll just, you know, jump right into it. Uh, this is maybe the best way to kind of think about this, right? Okay. My mother used to tell me, clean up your plate, there are starving people in China, right? There are cars all over the world starving for ethanol, so finish your corn, okay? okay. This kind of tells the story of ethanol recently. A year ago, we were making a buck a bushel profit on every bushel of corn we were putting through an ethanol plant. Six months ago, we were losing a buck a bushel. A little volatility there, okay? And more recently, generally, as you can see, the margin per bushel in the ethanol industry is negative for most ethanol operations, okay? It's not a particularly profitable industry right now. About 15% of the capacity is now off stream. We have a number of plants that are in financial distress, Verisun bankrupt, 
uh, with the largest, one of the largest in Wisconsin, Renewable Energy, declared bankruptcy two weeks ago. Uh, we've got one in Kansas. There's, if you look at, the, look at the number of firms that are on the edge, it's a pretty, pretty tough business to be in. Now, that kind of story uh, would, would, would give you, whoops, that kind of story would give you pause about the future of the ethanol industry itself, okay? And our expectation is that the ethanol industry is in a maturing phase. Uh, if you want a number, the work that Wally Tyner, a colleague of mine at Purdue, has doing, he's probably the best energy economist, renewable energy economist in the country. He uh, is arguing that this industry will, will mature out in terms of corn-based ethanol at about 15 billion gallons. We are now hitting the blend wall. Uh, the work we've done at Purdue indicates that we were going to hit the blend wall at least by 12 billion gallons of ethanol. And you see that showing up. What that means is that we don't need any more ethanol to blend if we're going to stay with a 10% blend, right? So we either have to go to E85 or we have to get the blend percentage up above 10%. And now there is major discussion. Uh, the CEO of POET just uh, has been uh, uh, around the countryside talking a lot about how to increase the ethanol blend to uh, 12 and to 15%. There is a challenge here, and the challenge here is not only is it a change in public policy to do that, the auto industry now doesn't warranty cars above a 10% blend. Now, I think the auto industry's probably got a few other problems to worry about before they think about solving that problem, right? So you've got to convince the private sector to make some changes to get that, to eliminate that blend wall as well. The other problem with the blend wall, to be honest, is we have the blending capacity for ethanol is on the east and west coast. Uh, it has not been beefed up particularly. We haven't made the investments on the west coast, <coughs> pardon me, on the east coast particularly. And so uh, uh, we just don't have the capacity to blend much more than 12 billion gallons in terms of physical capacity to do that blending, that splash bl blending. So that's part of the reason not only the decline in oil prices to less than $35 today, but also because ethanol now is, is, is being priced at about a buck 55, buck 60. Uh, that's part of the reason why this ethanol industry is in uh, the kind of condition it is. But the longer term opportunity here of the bioeconomy is really, really, I think, quite strong. And you can see the components of the bioeconomy that we think have potential if you think longer term. Uh, next generation biofuels certainly are there. Uh, and again, this isn't going to be popular to say, but uh, 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 cellulosic is still a ways away commercially. And uh, even when it comes, uh, the Brazilians will celebrate and blow us out of the water. Okay? Uh, it, 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 we are going to have to even work harder to keep. Brazilian ethanol out when we get cellulosic. We work with a company that's got three 100 million gallon plants under construction in Brazil. Uh, recognize that sugarcane ethanol is now 20% cheaper in the US, could be 20% cheaper if we didn't have to pay a tariff on it and have an import quota. You can put Brazilian ethanol into the US, sugar ethanol in the, in the US, 80% of corn-based ethanol cost-wise. You didn't have to pay a 54 cent tariff per gallon, and you got an import quota, okay? Sugarcane generates 10 times the tonnage per hectare or per acre as corn does, okay? So if you're thinking about a cellulosic product, now you got 10 times the tonnage, you got something that's really, really pretty profound to work with. Not only that, but they already, after they burn the leaves off, they already cut the cane and take it to the plant. The biggest challenge with cellulosic, to be quite frank, is not the enzyme. It's gathering that low bulk density stuff and storing that low bulk density stuff, particularly if it's corn-based, because most ethanol plants would like to run for an entire year. And corn is only available during part of the year, so you have to store for the whole season. With sugar, you already incur the cost of taking it to, to the plant. They squeeze the sugar out uh, to get to either a sugar product and or an ethanol product, so they can go either way depending upon markets. They have the bagasse. They burn the bagasse to fire the plant or to, to provide energy to the plant. 
All of those plants down there are now being built so that when cellulostic comes along, they will build a second cellulostic plant right next door. They will take the bagasse out of that first plant, move it over to the second plant, get a second stream of ethanol. The only cost they'll incur to get that is for the natural gas or the electricity to run that first plant. And so if they can do that, that's going to put their cost to somewhere closer to 70 or maybe even 60% of the cost of corn-based ethanol. So it's going to be a really, really tough sledding, I would argue. Not for cellulosic ethanol. I'm not arguing against cellulosic ethanol. I'm arguing a, 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 a issues associated with the feedstock of cellulosic ethanol. Uh, by the way, we could do that in the U.S. too. Uh, we have a sugar industry in the southern U.S., and the sugar industry in the southern U.S. is now starting to think about exactly this issue of positioning itself to take the technology out of Brazil and bring that into the U.S. and have sugar-based ethanol here in this country. My, my optimism about the future is the latter two on this, the biochemicals and the biomaterials that I think eventually will come from agriculture raw materials. Okay? From, from, from the carbon-based products that we produce in agriculture as a substitute for the carbon-based petroleum phenomena that most synthetic chemicals and fibers are manufactured out of, okay? Now, is that something we're going to have in five years? No. My expectation is in the 10 to 15 to 20 year time horizon. And so one of the issues I'll come back to here in a second again is somehow we have to bridge from the slowdown in the growth that, bio, that, inter, that, that ethanol is providing us, we've got to have something pick up the demand to bridge the growth for agricultural products until we get to some of these more exciting other uses for agricultural raw materials. And that bridge has to be, at least it would appear to me, to be animal proteins and exports of animal proteins. We'll talk about that in a second. Biopharma is also a possibility. We already have pig populations we're using to generate uh, uh, transplant, organ transplants. Uh, there is lab work being done on uh, how you manipulate both corn and tobacco. Uh, by the way, it's interesting, tobacco is one of the products that they're uh, genetically manipulating. That would be interesting to change tobacco from a bad to a good, wow. Manipulate it so that it in fact can uh, uh, be, be part of what we eat to reduce the incidence of cancer, reduce the incidence of Parkinson's, of, of Alzheimer's, MS, and other neurological diseases. 18% of the consumer's budget is spent on health care. What happens to agriculture if now we create products that will solve that 18% of the consumer's budget? Only 10% in the U.S. of consumer's budgets are spent on food, less than 10%. I mean, when you look at the opportunity we have to mainstream agriculture by taking the raw materials of this industry and providing a broader set of materials for broader sets of industries, okay, besides just the nutrition industry, you can get pretty excited about the long-term future of this industry, okay? And I think there are reasons to be very optimistic. Is it going to happen tomorrow? No. Are we going to have a bump in the road before it happens? Yes. But this gets one, it gets me at least pretty excited about the future of this industry. Now, let's talk about globalization real quickly. I think the subtitle here is probably appropriate for those of you young enough to not realize or know, realize or remember what happened in the 1970s in the middle of the Cold War when uh, Nikita Khrushchev had to crawl on his belly to come to the U.S. to buy food to feed his people. We were their arch enemy. This, this had to be one of the most demeaning things he had to do. Some people have said that started to be the undermining of that command and control system when you couldn't even feed yourself. You had to go to your enemy with their capitalistic market system to get the food. Why did they come to the U.S.? Why did they go to Australia? Why did they go someplace else? We were the only store in town. We were the only ones that had that much food to be able to provide them. But it's changed. It's changed dramatically. Now we're just a loaf of bread in the basket. Now there's two parts to this globalization. 
One is the increased demand globally, particularly for animal proteins. Okay? That's probably the best way to visualize it. That's a swimming pool in China. You don't swim many laps in that pool, right? 1.3 billion in China compared to 300 million in the U.S., roughly. In India, we have uh, new numbers this year compared to last year. Last year, they said they had a population of 800 million. This year, they said, oh, we found a few more people, a billion, okay? 2.3 billion people just in those two countries, okay? But it's not just that people. From an economist's perspective, it's people with money that make the difference. It's what we call effective demand. And here's that concept. As people make more money, which is what we're reflecting on this axis here, they increase the percentage of their diet that's animal protein based. Okay? And we see, if you look at this chart, you can see that we see down in here most of Asia, this classic hockey stick where they're profound. I mean, in essence, what happens is people make more money after they buy their TV set and their cell phone. They eat better. I used to say, uh, I used to be more careful with that. I shouldn't say that. They eat different, right? If there's any vegetarians in the room, I'm surprised I didn't get somebody to stand up and jump on me because some people don't believe eating animal proteins is better, right? They eat differently, they eat more animal proteins. India has been growing at 6 to 8% per year in its per capita income for the last 10, 15 years. China has been growing at 20% per year for the last, they've been moving for the last 20 years. They've been moving 10% for the last 20, they've both been moving very rapidly along that axis. But this economic recession has slowed that down profoundly. And that is the biggest concern we have over the next 24 months for agriculture is that if that occurs and ethanol matures out, which is maturing out in terms of the demand for agricultural products, and this economic growth slows down enough that we don't get this increased utilization of agricultural raw materials and animal production because of increased animal demand, we could be in for a period of classic short peak, long trough problems in agriculture. Okay? And by the way, that's the history. These peaks don't typically stay very long. They stay about three years. If it's a demand-driven peak, three to four, which is what we've had this time. If it's a supply peak, it's about one to two years. Okay? And then we go back to, a, the only question is, do you go down in the trough to where you were before, or do you stabilize at something a little bit higher than that? This is the biggest concern we have, is that we may not get this growing animal protein demand. By the way, just so you know, this phenomena is sustainable if we get the income growth. This has been occurring for 50 to 60 years. It's not just a recent phenomena, okay? It is, in fact, sustainable in terms of the source of, source of growth. So the long run, again, if we can get our economies going back and growing, is quite positive for agriculture, not only because of the broadening of the uses of agricultural products in other industries, but also because of this increased demand for just the nutrition market, not the U.S. domestic demand, but the export demand. But there is a challenge, and that's the challenge. That is soybean production in Brazil. Now, you probably can't see it, but that's 32 combines going across the field in fleet formation with 18 no-till planters behind them. That's the way they do it <coughs> in Brazil. I don't know how many of you have looked at the Altahera web website, an Argentine-based company. Uh, they have a website. You can look them up. They're, as far as I know, they're the largest production company in the world. There is one in the Ukraine that maybe is close to it. Uh, El Tejera farms in four countries. They are in Argentina, Brazil, uh, uh, Bolivia, and Paraguay. Okay? 750,000 acres. Their goal is a million. And it was for 
pretty traditional Argentine five, pretty traditional Argentine families in central Argentina with 20,000 acres 20 years ago that decided that there had to be a better way to farm than what they were doing it, okay? They own no farmland. They own no machinery. They are classic deal makers. They are deal makers. That's what they do. They make deals in terms of buying and selling, okay? And they have been able to be quite successful growing their business. So, so we have to think about how to compete with this, right? But actually, when I say Brazil, that's what most farmers think about is soybeans, right? That's really not the problem, okay? Our number one agricultural export in the U.S. longer term for the last 20 years has been animal proteins and it's been specifically poultry, okay? Brazil exports more poultry than we do and it's growing faster. They're already there in the animal protein. What did we say earlier is where the demand's gonna be? Animal proteins. Brazil is already playing the game very, very effectively, okay? But we need to understand that, and I talk about Brazil because I think it's a classic situation not unlike maybe where we were back earlier this century. The economic development strategy for Brazil is what? Agriculture. The president of the country worries about agriculture in contrast to the president of this country. I'm not trying to be political, I'm just saying that it is the focal point of that country, okay? If they continue, if they continue to grow their public sector R&D activity at the rate it has grown for the last 10 years, in Brapa, in five years, they will be the largest public sector R&D organization in the world. And that includes the U.S. Department of Agriculture here in the United States. That is a sobering statistic. That is a sobering statistic for us. Can we compete with Brazil? Absolutely. But we cannot be complacent. We cannot be complacent that just because this market is going to grow, they're going to come to us like Khrushchev did in the 70s. There are plenty of other competitors out there. Now, we haven't even talked about what's going on right now in terms of the Black Sea region, in terms of the increased wheat production in the Ukraine, Ukraine and other parts of that. And don't ever forget, by the way, even though I don't produce any wheat on my farm in northern Iowa, most of you don't produce wheat. The crop I watch is wheat, because wheat caps corn. Wheat is not a food grain. It is a feed grain in most of the world, okay? Most of the world doesn't feed corn. They feed wheat. And wheat has about 110% of the nutritional value of a bushel of corn. So if you've got $5 wheat, you can't have over 450 corn. If you've got $4 wheat, you can't have over 360 corn. And we have had profound, dramatic increases in wheat production in uh, the Black Sea area, the Baltic states, et cetera. And that's part of the reason not that and oil prices are why we've seen some of the significant declines we've seen in corn and soybean prices. So we have this issue of competition in these markets, uh, uh, and, 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 and we don't have time to go over it in detail. I would just mention a couple of other quick things when we look at this slide that we need to recognize. Uh, I, I, tell, I tell farmers there are three things you ought to watch to kind of predict corn prices, okay? Three things. Number one is you watch the price of oil, okay? For the last, for the last 36 months, there's been a 90% correlation between the price of oil and the price of corn. You could get up in the morning, look at the paper, find out what happened to the price of oil. You knew what was going to happen to the price of corn. 90% correlation. Now, that's being severed right now. That's being disconnected. But it's been a very tight correlation. So you look at the price of oil. Second thing you look at is the value of the dollar. Okay? We've had a declining value of the dollar by 45% from 2002 to 2008. And that's why, in spite of everybody saying that this ethanol demand of about a third of the corn crop was going to come out of exports, it didn't. Exports stayed flat. It came out of the livestock industry. And the reason is because corn was cheap in the rest of the world. So were soybeans, okay? Because of the declining value of the dollar. 
Now that dollar has gone up by about four, to, well, actually now about 20 percent in the last two or three months. Boy, are we conflicted in agriculture. What do we want? Well, if we want strong exports, we want a weak dollar. But on the other hand, we certainly don't want the financial stress and not being able to access the capital markets that we have had in the last, at least some people have had, and the markets generally have had in the last two months. The markets have, have reflected a higher value dollar in part because of, in, of the, flight to safe, or the flight to quality fly, flying back to the U.S. dollar. Our economy is in trouble, but it's not in as much trouble as most of the other economies, okay? So the value of the dollar and exchange rates are extremely important, okay? The other thing, to, by the way, I should tell you, I look at three things, and I've already told you what they are. I look at the price of oil, I look at what's happened to the value of the dollar, and I look at the price of wheat, okay? Now I can figure out what's going to happen to corn prices or soybean prices. Corn and soybeans are tied together. But the other side of this we need to understand is what we've done to restructure the input markets. Close to 60% of our nitrogen today is imported. Close to 60% of our nitrogen is imported. And that supply line is somewhere between 30 and 60 to 70 days long, okay? Which means that that stuff, even if I wanted it, is going to take, if, if the, it has to be purchased, it's going to take some two to three months before it shows up on my farm, even if I buy it and pay cash for it. Talk about those people who bought and paid cash for that. One of the reasons why that is the case is we've had a low value to the dollar. Okay? About, uh, about a third of the rise, no, well, maybe, yeah, about a third of the rise in the price of fertilizer is due to the fact that we've had a change in the exchange rate. Okay? Lower value dollar results in higher costs associated with the purchasing of our inputs. And now since we're sourcing more and more of our inputs from offshore, that's more important to agriculture than it used to be. If you go home tonight and say, you know, I better start watching the Wall Street Journal, the Business Press, Newsweek, pardon me, uh, Business Week, Forbes, Fortune, maybe I ought to start reading that stuff. You've gone home with probably the most important thing. Agriculture is increasingly being shaped by what's going on outside the industry than what's happening in the industry. Increasingly, it's all those things out there that are shaping our industry, not what's happening within our industry, okay? We've already talked about public sector ag R&D. I'm going to get on the soapbox a second, if it's okay. We have had a window of opportunity in the area of infrastructure that we may have missed with the assistance package that the government just signed. How much in this commitment to infrastructure, how much specifically was there for rural roads, rural bridges, rural rail, and redoing the locks and dams on the Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois rivers? The answer is not much. We've been worried about our infrastructure and solving our infrastructure problems, which are major, our major advantage relative to Brazil is infrastructure. It isn't because we got better yields. That's not true. They actually have higher quality beans. And the cost per bushel for fertilizer, seed, and chemicals is almost identical in Brazil as it is here in the U.S. to push, produce a bushel of beans. Our disadvantage is high cost for labor and land, but we offset that with very, very good infrastructure. So we can ship that stuff around the world. They're solving their infrastructure problems. Are we solving ours? We had a window. We missed the opportunity, in my personal judgment. That was a big, big mistake. Because those windows don't open up very often for infrastructure types of investments. Okay? Here's what we talked about in terms of the value of the dollar. We need to finish this up. Uncertainty. Certainly a lot of uncertainty now associated with the agricultural industry. I'm just going to give you a couple of charts here. Here's what I mentioned earlier in terms of the relationship between corn and crude. They mirror each other almost completely. Now, everybody remembers the collapse of the corn market 
particularly if you were in the corn market like I am, you remember the collapse of the corn market from roughly $8 or seven plus to somewhere in that four to five dollars. It took us about, what, three, four months to go through that collapse process, right? How would you like to be a fertilizer dealer? Look at that red line. Fertilizer, de fertilizer wholesale prices went from 850 a ton to 250 a ton in 3 days never have we seen that kind of action in these markets and there's an awful lot of fertilizer dealers that bought fertilizer laid it in at $800 a ton what the heck are they going to do I, I tell bankers, we work a lot with bankers, I tell bankers, if you have any fertilizer seed chemical dealers in your portfolio, put them on your watch list because they are much more vulnerable than any other business loan you have because of exactly this. It's a huge, huge issue. And many of us are frustrated with the fact that the fertilizer industry at the retail level, that's, this is not retail, this is wholesale, that the retail industry is not making the adjustments uh, in fact, I've had some people call my dean and say, Bolgey keeps saying these things about prices have to come down. We don't want them to say that anymore, right? Uh, this market has to adjust, okay? Uh, we're going to have to have some reduction in these retail prices. But can you understand the dilemma? There's only about 100 at the most, $100 a ton margin in that fertilizer. So if I have to sell that fertilizer I paid 800 for, hoping, uh, you know, I paid 800 hoping to get, or 700 hoping to get 800 for, if I have to sell that at four or three, I just wipe my business off the map. This is capital wipeout stuff, okay? That's why fertilizer dealers are saying, we can't do this. We cannot do this. We've got to have four and a half or five for this stuff. We can take maybe a hundred or a two hundred dollar per ton hit. We cannot take a three to four hundred dollar per ton hit. I, I want you to recognize that we in agriculture think that we're the only ones that have risk, right? My friends that uh, keep telling me, I, well, I don't, you know, other industries don't have other risk. I say, have you ever tried to run a resort? Huh? You talk about weather risk, try to run a ski lodge, right? Or even an energy company, right? They got weather risk. What happens in terms of weather influences profoundly the demand for this. So there's a lot of other industries that have a lot of it. So we got this whole set of risk. We have had a profound resurgence of risk for the agriculture. We had an industry, to be very frank, on the grain side, that a combination, you won't like to hear this, but just think about it, a combination of government program protection and highly subsidized crop insurance really from 2002 to 2007, didn't have much risk. Now, it didn't have good prices either, I understand that. But it was kind of like I'm on a higher wire and the safety net's right there where I could just step over on it. Now we're up here with a safety net down here. And the government isn't managing the risk for farmers anymore at the same level it was. And now the question is, what are we going to do as businessmen to manage that risk? Okay. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of this except I just want you to note what I've done in terms of the order here. Most of the time when we talk about agricultural policy relative to agriculture, we get all hung up on the farm bill. If you are in the livestock business, immigration policy may be as important, if not more important to you, because your workforce is heavily Hispanic and you've got to worry about how they handle undocumented workers. I've got a friend in the dairy business, very sizable dairy farm. He has a business arrangement with the seven other dairy operations that are in his consortium that if he calls them in the morning and says, there was a, there was a rumor of a raid last night and half my workforce didn't show up. And by the way, we can document five cases in Nebraska where that is farms, not, not packing plants, farms, where that's happening, okay? He's got an arrangement so they'll ship him part of their workforce so those cows get milked, okay? 
I mean, strategic risk, huge strategic risk, okay? Immigration policy is a really important part of the agricultural policy. Environmental policy, food safety, transportation, just to put it in context, this, the implicit subsidy that farmers receive out of the ethanol subsidy that's now passed through in terms of higher prices of corn is a larger amount of money going to agriculture than what agriculture receives out of the farm bill. Okay? I mean, if you're really dollar driven, we want to make sure we get an, our share of the government money. You worry more about energy policy than you do about the farm bill, okay? And yet our focus has heavily been on the farm bill. I, I, I had to put this in. I'm sorry I put it in in a way, but I just had to. The current program we have for financial assistance uh, uh, that Obama has uh, signed now, probably the biggest fear I have of that program is the Buy America Clause. Every Every ton of steel that's going to be used in all these infrastructure projects has to be U.S. steel. If you look at the history of the Depression, there were two fundamental reasons why it lasted 10 years and was as deep as it was. Number one, government intervention too late and inadequate, Fed policy too late and inadequate. Number two, protectionism. We turned inward. Got to protect us from all those bad people out there in other countries. Buy America, I think, is a very, very serious concern with this new program we have. We don't have time to talk about the rest of it. I think we're really kind of in this situation, okay? What have you got for an economist whose theories have recently been discredited, looking for sympathy cards. We don't have really good answers today for a lot of this stuff. We're searching around for the answer. The markets didn't like, I'm not trying to be political, I'm just saying the markets clearly did not like what the administration, this administration is proposing. The markets didn't like what the last administration proposed, okay? They're clearly very, very uncertain about this. Our economic models just have not generally helped us understand these kinds of problems. Resource challenges from plenty to go around to conflicts, okay? Uh, this whole issue of land and open space, we, again, we don't have time to go into detail. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about here. I would just mention the one issue here that I think is really important for the agricultural industry is this issue of siting and location, particularly as it relates to livestock production, okay? That is a challenge for us. Uh, if, if I were, and this is probably why I'm not, if I were the czar of a public sector research institution like Iowa State University, the number one priority I'd have to maintain the livestock industry in this state or in any state in the Midwest is to figure out how to make sure that animal wastes do not have odor and animal wastes don't have water pollution problems we don't solve those problems, we will find it difficult to put livestock in Indiana, Iowa, or any place to be. As a matter of fact, where you got people. In the U.S., people and animals don't mix very well, okay? Those problems are solvable with technology, in my judgment. Those problems are solvable with technology. We've got a guy who says, I am going to end up being able to put hogs in the, in the Hoosier Dome in the middle of Indianapolis. We're going to fix that problem. I think that's the number one problem for the livestock industry today is solving that problem. Then we got a whole bunch of other issues. We've already talked about it, uh, odor and water quality. New ideas and technology. Part of the solution to those resource problems is what we call induced innovation. Induced innovation is that when the problem gets more ser serious enough and it has economic consequences, public and private sector firms do something about it. They make investments to solve those problems, right? And, and, and that's a well understood concept in economics is, is, is uh, uh, induced innovation, okay? Uh, in agriculture, there's a whole set of innovations that we ought to be thinking about and we're doing simplify and automate. We're moving more and more. I mean, that's what, that's what triple stack, of, of what triple stack means. That's what 
Roundup Ready soybeans are, triple stack corn. It's, an, uh, it's a technology that makes corn production easier and soybean production easier than it used to be. I've got a farmer friend who says, you know, uh, ain't too hard, pardon my English, to produce soybeans these days. It takes, you've got four jobs. Number one, you go out in the field with your cell phone, look around, call up the local elevator and say, come out and shoot it with Roundup. Doesn't take an awful lot of skill to do that. By the way, this is a farmer, a real live farmer, not me. Job number two is plant it. Job number three, go out in the field two weeks later, see a bunch of weeds, call the elevator again and say, come on and do it again and do it right this time. Number four is harvest. Well, I know we got to worry a little bit about the aphids now and we got a few other bugs out there, but see, his point was we have simplified soybean production to the point where you don't have to be a particularly good farmer to get pretty decent yields, the way we used to have to spend the whole winter trying to figure out the right kind of weed regime program that my father and his father had to do. We're taking technology. We worry about capital saving or capital using and labor saving technology. Actually, the technology we're doing today, I think, is better described in terms of simplification technology. Simplifying the production processes, okay? Automating the production process. Uh, sustaining versus disruptive innovation. Uh, uh, this is a business school concept that says what we're trying to do is have innovations or we want to look for innovations that disrupt the entire markets, and one of those disruptive innovations is the technology of uh, bio, biogenetics that is going to redefine the health industry and the nutrition industry when we get those biopharma types of products, okay? Uh, we talk about biological manufacturing, which is not a politically correct thing to talk about, I fully understand, but it is, in fact, the real world today in agriculture. Uh, biotech and nutrition, triple, triple stack is an example. Information, PDAs, I don't know how many of you farm your farm with a PDA, but I've got a farmer friend who, he's four employees, every one of them has their own personal PDA, okay? They come to work in the morning, they get their PDA, it has their work schedule, it has a schedule. It says between seven and nine you do these things. Between nine and 11 you do these things. It tells them what to do and it also says, and it ought not to take you more than this amount of time to do it, right? At the end of the day, they all bring their PDAs in. He had, oh, by the way, they have another. The PDA also has a record. If they're working in the, in, the, in, the, in the pork operation, they keep track on this record of the feed and what the kind of feed, what kind of medications they did. If they're out there in the, in the fields doing things, they've got a GPS tied to their PDA, just like, uh, like you would have if you had a GPS in your airplane. Uh, they, they, and and they, can, they can put in messages in terms of there's weed problem here, there's a tile problem over here, there's et cetera. They can, they can, they just, they, they hit it and it, it's, it, it, it prints out maps. At the end of the day, they bring their PDAs in, he hot syncs them into his informa to central information system. He's got daily records. He eventually wants to get daily cost information. I don't know why, but that's where he's headed, okay? It then updates the PDA because maybe it rained today and they can get some things done, right? Updates the PDA the next morning, they get their schedule again. That's done today in almost all, not all, a lot of the manufacturing industries. That's the standard operating procedures, okay? Computer-based processing. Employees working with computers. It's coming to agriculture. Process control, GPS guidance, common one that we see today. You don't see very many new sprayers going out of the manufacturing plants without a GPS. And uh, Deere will tell you that somewhere around 60 to 70% of their power units have a GPS as standard equipment, okay? Standard operating procedures. All right, so let's talk real quickly here, just for a few minutes, we're gonna do a classic two-minute drill about what the challenges and the opportunities are associated with this for the agricultural industry. We've already talked about some of this, but there's even broader than the bio-based material new markets in terms of recreational activities. You probably don't have maybe quite as much of that as we might have in a state like Indiana, but you'd be surprised how much recreational revenue there is uh, coming out of cities of, like Chicago and Indianapolis into the rural countryside for hunting, uh, for fishing, uh, for just open space, okay? Just open space. You go down to Austin, Texas, and you'll find that a large portion of the farmland to the, to the, to the west of Austin, Austin, Texas 
is owned by people who have bought it. They rent it back to the person they bought it from to run the cattle or do the farming. They bought it simply to get open space and have hunting and other rights. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of things there. Carbon sequestering, energy production, bio-based market. We've already talked about that. Organic, natural, local. Now, this is an interesting issue. Because when I say organic, what size farm do most people think about? Small. Not true. California has the most organic production in agriculture in the US. Over 50% of the of organic production in the state of California is done by four large farms. <coughs> Let me just, uh, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just, just telling you a fundamental economic concept. Any highly regulated market has a high fixed cost component. And any situation where you have a lot of high fixed cost, you want to have more and more output to spread those fixed costs. Small operators struggle with a highly regulated production system. And that regulation doesn't, I don't mean by regulation, government regulations. It could be regulations imposed by the channel, by the buyer and supplier in these markets. You gotta have, you gotta meet certain rules, regulations. You gotta have certain documentation, gotta have certain kind of records. And if you can only spread that cost over one acre versus a thousand acres, it gives the advantage to the large operation. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's good, I'm just saying it is, okay? And that's why when the markets get big enough in any of these Mitch markets, particularly if they're highly regulated market, what happens is the larger operators have a tendency to become more dominant in that market. Now the only part of this that, where that, that falls apart though, which I think does provide real opportunities for smaller scale growers is local. Local does not have the opportunity. It's hard to be local in producing your stuff in California and shipping it to Iowa. It doesn't quite cut the local definition, right? Now, there is a whole debate about what local really is, right? Some people say it's the same state. Some people say it's the same community, et cetera. What I'm trying to suggest to you is for small-scale farmers, they have a, probably a sustainable competitive advantage in local. I'm not sure they do have a sustainable competitive advantage in organic and natural. Organic and natural are going to grow to about 18 to 20% of the market. Whether you and I think it's a product you and I want to buy is not the question. There are some people willing to pay for it, although the growth rate has slowed down recently. Another thing that we need to recognize is that some farmers are going to probably make more money not by what they produce, but the services they put around it. I've got a farmer friend in... Uh, Idaho, who sells his barley to a brewery, commodity brow barley. By the way, he used an interesting strategy. He went to his buyer and said, what can I do for you to create value? Oh, that's interesting. How many farmers go to their elevator and say, what can I do for you to create value? Well, no, most of them go and complain because the hours aren't right, right? They're my customer. What can I do to create value? They said, can I produce a different kind of barley? Nope. But we're really not good at managing inventory, they said. Could you be our JIT inventory manager? What do I got to do, Sam said. We want to call you any time of the day, any day of the week, and have you deliver within three hours 5,000 bushels of barley. And we'll pay you 10% premium on all of the barley we buy from you. Not just that that you deliver under the JIT contract. He said, I had the trucks, I had the people, a no-brainer. And he said, that's sustainable. A lot of other people could have produced different kinds of barley because the markets are going to make that technology available to everybody. But services are hard for others to mimic. And we in agriculture have not thought enough about what we can do to surround our products with services that are sustainable and will create value. There's a lot of strategic choices we have to make to manage the strategic risk associated with what's going on today. 
the whole question right now, short term of crop mix, the corn bean question, uh, livestock choices in terms of can we continue to grow our livestock enterprises, those are strategic choices we have to worry about. And maybe we have to worry about the business model by which we grow it. And the business model, one of risk mitigation, okay? I mean, the pork industry has moved very aggressively to contractual and other kinds of arrangements because it was a risk mitigation strategy in general, okay? And we can tell you stories and stories about people who have been extremely successful with that business model that has struggled in some parts of the country to be accepted. And I found it was really, really a struggle in Indiana. We have a lot of Indiana farmers that just weren't willing to go into contract production. And guess what? They aren't producing pigs anymore. Okay? The market changed on them. They weren't willing to do it. Closed loop systems, cobalt production, recycling, integrated crop and livestock. I think we're going to see a future of agriculture that reintegrates crop and livestock production. It's not going to be the old way, though. I'm going to have some pigs on my farm. What we're going to have is we're going to have this unit over here producing crops, this maybe separate unit over here producing livestock. We'll sign contracts and other arrangements to capture the synergistic benefits of having crops and livestock together the animal waste, et cetera, but we're not going to do it in the old classic, I am going to try to be successful in producing both because I'm not going to be very good at either one of them if I try to do that. Finally, this whole question of what not to do, most farmers have to make some critical choices in terms of what not to do. We don't spend a lot of time on that. We suggest to farmers that they have to spend about 20, an agribusiness plan as well, about 25% of their time deciding what to quit doing. And that's a tough thing to do. What do I get out of? Because if I'm going to grow my business and I don't get out of something, I'm probably going to eventually outgrow my managerial skill set. I may have plenty of capital, may have plenty of other things, but I'll grow my managerial skill set. Implementing supply chains, tracking and tracing, inventory logistics, maintaining market access, that's a key issue. A key issue in agriculture as we move away from the independent business model to models that are more tightly aligned, and a lot of people don't like that. I understand that because it's challenging some of our fundamental independence values in the industry. But it's going to be happening. It's a, it's, there's too many advantages to that, and we've done a lot of work in this area, research and otherwise, to the value of those more tightly aligned value chains. As that happens, then it's going to be really important for us as producers to figure out how to align with the right buyers and the right suppliers. Let me put this very explicitly for you this year. You will find, if you haven't found it already, that when you try to buy fertilizer next year, you're going to have to probably sign a contract, and it's going to be a contract that says, I will probably buy fertilizer from you for, for, from this dealer for two years, and we will share the risk. Open market transactions with the kind of volatility we've got in the fertilizer industry are disappearing. The classic spot market is going away. We're going to have contractual arrangements in it. We actually had, we actually had uh, uh, livestock farmers in the southeast in the poultry industry come to Indiana last year when ethanol was growing so fast, signing five-year supply contracts for corn, saying, we've got to lock up our corn supply because we may not have corn if we don't do that. These markets are changing very dramatically. Technology and timeliness, we've already talked about that as well. Workflow scheduling, modularity, and, and uh, uh, a pot or replicate strategy, that's, that's the common strategy for expanding now in most industries, agricultural included, is to use what we call the pot or, or replicate. I find out what the optimal size plant is, whether it be a dairy operation or a set of hog buildings. For Smithfield, it was 3,600 sows, and then I just build 3,600 sow replicated farms. Got a dairy operation in, in Indiana. Their optimal size plant is 3,000 cows. They now have 12 3,000 cow dairies plants in northern Indiana. Boy, I thought that was California or Texas. Uh-uh. That business model, rightly or wrongly, is coming to us. So the new agriculture, and we've got time maybe for a few questions. 
here's what the new agriculture, in my judgment, is going to look like. It's going to provide real opportunity for those who are willing to think about agriculture in a new context. This is not my father's farming. I'm not saying I wish it was or wasn't. I'm making no judgments here about whether this is good or bad. I'm just saying the economic forces are such that it's moving us into a new agricultural paradigm. So what we're going to do is biologically manufacture specific attribute raw materials for nutritional, pharmaceutical, and industrial product end uses. Boy, that's not growing stuff anymore, which is what we do now. We're going to biologically manufacture this stuff. Uh, just a quick comment on that. I don't know if you recognize the name. Uh, Jim Mosley, former Assistant Secretary of Agriculture. He's a farmer in Indiana. I introduced Jim at a meeting once, and I said, which is, which is partially accurate, I said, this is one of the most successful pork, pardon me, pig hog farmers in the state of Indiana. I've known Jim for a number of years. Jim said, well, typical, you know, Bolgey's wrong most of the time. He said, I'm not a pig farmer. I manufacture pork. That's my job. Those buildings out there, they're an assembly line. And you know that animal that walks out of there? He's a carrier. I don't care about pigs. I care about the products they carry. I manufacture pork. That's my job. And that's what the industry moved to. See the same thing happening in other industries. Potatoes are there. Milk's going there. Tomatoes are there. It's going to happen in corn and beans. How will we do it? Integrated value chains enable genetic supply traceability. How will we compete? Better, faster, not just cheaper. Thank you very much. I can't believe you agree with everything I said. The question is, how will the financial industry change their method of securitization of loans to make it more viable in, 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 in the future? I, I think what you're going to find is a couple of things happening. We, we are going to have less securitization in general occur. So more and more of our lending activity will be held in the portfolio, and that's going to be a constraint on the lending that we can do. That's going to be naturally kind of restricting the lending activity. I mean, that's, to be honest, that's the problem we have right now. It's not that banks can't make loans. They have two problems. It's not that they don't want to make loans. They have two problems. Number one is they are worried about the creditworthiness of the customer. That's number one. Number two, if it's a big loan, they can't find anybody to sell a participation in, right? That market is just absolutely dried up. And by the way, that's relevant to agriculture too. That's not just in the housing market because a lot of our large agribusiness companies have been financed with participation activity and they're out there struggling, including the farm credit system. The farm credit system has got a lot of stuff that it's trying to figure out how to work its way through, okay? So we're going to see, basically, that's going to result in a, in, a, in, a, in a reduction in kind of the ability to have uh, uh, activity in the market. We're not going to have as much funding because of that. The second, so you're going to have a lot of, of, of these that are going to be port, put, stay, to, stay in the portfolio, right? The, the other thing I think that we're going to find happen is that you're going to have securitization, but you're going to have securitization where it's only one or two steps not 17, where we end up taking and doing the classic swaps and slicing and dicing of these and put it out into a whole bunch of other institutions, right? So what I'll do is I, as a banker, will find I have a good, solid relationship with you and with him and with him, 
And so I will basically sell my participations to you and your portfolio, right? Rather than you saying, well, I just got to sell that to the next person down the street. And that guy says, I got to sell it to the next. I mean, this thing basically, if you look at it, if you look at the work that's been done, there is a company out there that actually is doing this now. A large proportion of these collateralized debt obligations were not traceable back to the original loan. We had no clue where that money really, really, what was the security behind that in terms of the original loan. It wasn't traceable. There's a company now that charges big bucks to actually do that, to uncover how to go from this collateralized debt obligation back to a particular loan. We're going to probably shorten that chain profoundly and have more clear traceability so we can know, so I can know what I'm buying from you and you can know what you're buying from me. It's going to be unwound by uh, variations of what we're already doing, and that is putting a whole lot of government money out there to buy down bad debt. Okay? There are people that say there's about a tr $2 trillion of that stuff still sitting out there. Yeah. Dr. Bozier, you've covered a lot of uh, territory. One of the things that, uh, that I wish you'd comment on, there's a about a, there's an organization that spends about $250 million a year lobbying for animal rights. They pretty well destroyed the horse industry, at least the horse slaughter industry. Uh, how, do, do we need to defend ourselves against these kinds of activists? How, what, what is the strategy for a new agriculture if we have to fight animal rights? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so, so one could take a kind of a pessimistic approach to this and say that's mm -hmm. part of the sets of rules that we have here that you probably don't have quite as onerous in other parts of the world, right? They don't have probably the same set of rules, I don't think, in Argentina, Brazil, uh, uh, China, uh, or Romania, or Poland, which is basically where Smithfield is expanding its pork operations, not in the U.S. They don't have the same set of rules. That kind of fits in with that environmental set of rules that is kind of what we have. Now, let me, let me flip the other side of that. Uh, is there a little bit of validity in some of these arguments as to well, how we're treating animals? You know, we have to be a little bit careful that we don't think it's all black and white. There's a bunch of gray here. Temple Grandin whether you respect her for what she's done or not, has been widely recognized for saying, you know, there are some things we can do to structure the loading facilities just off the farm and the way we treat these animals to reduce the fright that they might have of getting up on a truck. And by the way, there's an economic benefit of that as well. Or change the unloading facilities and the stunning shoots at packing plants. So there's, I would argue, some things that we ought to think about doing differently in terms of the way we go about treating animals. Um, we are going to struggle in the U.S. with this issue, uh, particularly because most people, and particularly children in the U.S., think of animals differently than you and I do. And the animal rights people fully understand that. They're very bright. That's why, that's why for example, they initially uh, worked uh, on, uh, on uh, trying to get, Mc get McDonald's to change their policies. Because they knew the McDonald's sold to kids. That's why they didn't go to Burger King. Because Burger King sells to adults. Okay, they knew that if they got, they could, they had a better chance of having. I mean, when I take my grandchildren in and they're out there, uh, uh, outside the, the 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 McDonald's door, picketing, and they're saying that we're mistreating animals, my grandkids ask me about that. What do you do? Are we doing that, Grandpa? Is that what you do on your farm, Grandpa? How do you answer that question? Without lying to them. That's the reality we face. 
So I think we're going to have to figure out how to improve our practices of how we handle animals. Because I think if we don't do that, just like if I think we have to figure out how to improve our practices of handling animal waste. Because if we don't do that, and, I, I, and that's the point, there is technology out to do that. We don't do that, this industry is going to have another reason to go offshore. And it's got lots of reasons to go offshore anyway. It's probably not the answer you'd like to hear. Uh, that's that, 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 is, that is asserted by some people to be the goal. Could you repeat what he oh, said? The, the, yeah, I'm sorry. The, 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 the question there, the comment was made is that, that the, the animal rights industry, their fundamental goal is to eliminate completely uh, uh, any animal production and consumption of animal products in the U.S. That's where they're trying to, to be. To end up. There are some of the more radical parts of that group that do have that orientation. Okay? I, I think we need to be careful, very careful, that we don't brand the entire movement with that image. Because what happens to us then is it gives us license to say, no, we're not going to make any changes. They're all nuts. Right? And, 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 and uh, let, me, let me just be very frank. If we get into a f cat fight on this one, I predict we will lose. All I'm, all I'm saying is the argument is if we did that, okay, let's, let's use that as a starting point. Okay. What would we do with all the land and the taxes and all the Well, well, uh, be careful here, uh, because because uh, uh, we could export every bushel of corn we produce in this country, and we would probably still have a hundred percent of land in production. It's just going to go produce pigs someplace else. You're right. In the context of the southeast U.S., as well as the mountain states that have sufficiently rough land that are now have beef cows on it, will struggle with what their alternative is. You're absolutely right there, okay? But there's nothing that says that if we produce those animals someplace else that we wouldn't have the opportunity to produce the grain here and move it there. Well, there has actually been in, uh, modeling of, of, of what the feed cost. Uh, John Lawrence has uh, been involved in some of that, what these high feed costs are going to do to animal production. I think, John, the estimates I had seen you and your shop do indicated that if we have the 4 to $5 corn area, we're going to have about a 7 to 10% downsizing of the animal industries in this country okay, because of high feed cost. Okay? I mean, again, I, I, I'm not trying to be a pessimist, but I think the animal industry... Uh, l let me say it differently. One of the advantages we've had for the animal industry in this country is we've had relatively low feed, okay? Low feed cost. And those, those advantages now are, are, are disappearing, and then we have on top of that some additional disadvantages that are increasingly becoming important, like issues associated with odor, water, treatment of animals, et cetera. I think actually those issues, the latter issues, can be solved more easier than the feed cost problem. I think they're solvable with technology. Yeah, I was wondering if you might comment on what we sometimes refer to as secondary or external costs with the, this model that you are proposing. And I'm thinking of specific water quality issues. So this state is number one in corn, soybeans, and hogs. And from the reports I've seen, we have the worst rivers in the Union, and we have the most expensive water treatment plant in the whole world. 
So I, I'm just wondering if you'd comment on yeah. that. Yeah. See, well, I, I think you're raising some really important issues that are problematic because our economic system, the way it's de described right now, does not force us to capture those costs the way we do the, the economic analysis. In other words, what I'm saying is that the private sector firms are not incented or forced to capture those costs as part of their cost of production. So what we've had to do is we've had to have public policy that has changed the, the, the rules of the game to internalize those costs. Another way to internalize those costs is to start basically saying if you're going to be creating water problems or air problems, there isn't going to be a cost associated with that negative good you're, you're creating. You know, we, we don't have a tendency to do that in, 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 yet in agriculture. It's done in other industries. We haven't done that. Agriculture, you don't like this, but agriculture is well behind other industries of having to be responsive to environmental issues. Most other industries have had to be more responsive. Part of the reason is because those industries have been dominated by larger businesses that it's perceived rightly or wrongly, they have the capacity to either absorb or pass through to the eventual buyer those additional costs. Agriculture is primarily a small firm industry where those costs would be sufficient to put them out of business and they have very little capacity to pass them along to the end user unless they are regulated, okay? So part of the reason we have been behind the power curve, and that I would argue is because of those reasons. But we will, we are making changes, having to make changes. Yeah, um, yeah this is my 33rd year of farming, and I, uh, I, I studied economics at a different land-grant college. And I think it's important for the young people here to know that there have been economists that could have predicted this outcome. They, they, could have, they predicted what kind of an agriculture we face today where all the livestock are in big confinement feedlots and where we have bigger and bigger uh, grain farms. And this system is spreading all over the world at the expense of rainforests and savannas and uh, crowding people into big cities. You mentioned India. Uh, I saw a program the other night on public TV. The capital of Delhi has over 2 million people in it. And one million people live in shanty, shanty houses, or, you know, tin shacks with no running water and no sewers. And when you talk about cheap labor, like in Brazil, that's where the chicken factories go. That's because they have cheap labor. They have people that are willing to work for almost nothing. Or in Mexico, where they make $4 a day. So there have been economists that could have predicted that and could have predicted the, the horrendous situation we're facing in this country today. For instance, John Maynard Keynes who said that we should have international commodity agreements to put a floor under commodity prices and to, and to aim for fu uh, full employment. But so, he was, so, he, so, now, so. Oh, wait, now he was demonized and, and the economists that, that gained favor at land-grant colleges, in fact all of the colleges in the United States and politicians were those that preached for the free market. Like, for instance, uh, uh, yourself... Uh, could, could you ask a question? I'd yeah, be happy to respond yeah, okay. to it. Yeah, okay. Tell me why the, uh, the fertilizer dealers, when they were buying $800 a ton anhydrous in the wholesale market, why weren't they using risk management and selling a contract in the futures market to hedge their purchase? Because there is no such futures contract in fertilizer. That's the problem. There's no... That institutional there's no structure... There's no futures contract? No, not on fertilizer. There is a futures contract on natural gas. We've done work looking okay. at cross-hedging on natural gas. It's not a good cross-hedge. There are non-regulated, uh, 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 over-the-counter opportunities in that, but they are not the kind of stuff that anybody really, really feels very comfortable with. There's actually a London exchange that does playing in this area, and, and what, but there's and just no, there is no futures question. market there. Why haven't economists like you and Luther Tweeten and Don Parlberg supported agricultural policy so that we would have a floor under farm prices, we would have reserves so that we knew that the price of corn wouldn't go, wouldn't go so high as to drive people out of the livestock industry or, or shut down um, um, ethanol plants. Why, why, since you want to well, keep well, the cost in the price of the commodities, that's the kind of policy let, that would have done let it. Let me comment in two dimensions on it. We actually did have in this country a reserve program. 
We have had farmer reserve. Our, it wasn't economists that got rid of that program. Let me tell you, it was farmers that got rid of that program. That, that's farmers decided as a group that they did not want to have those reserves overhanging the market. And no. it wasn't Don Parlberg. I can guarantee you, because I know Don now deceased very well. It wasn't Don that did that. It wasn't we economists. It was farmers. That well, did that. If, all you have to do is go back and look at some books by Ezra Taft Benson and look at the type of uh, economist that supported his point of view, and you'll know very well. In fact, uh, Earl Butts, for instance, he so, preached so against reserves. I'm going to interrupt and say that this is a conversation you all could carry on later. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we owe I'd, I'd love to debate <laughs> this issue. Right. I think we've got some good right. stuff to talk I know. about. So, thank you. So tomorrow up on the college's webpage will be Dr. Boji's PowerPoint. And within a week, we'll have the video of today's presentation. Please share it with your friends. Thank you for coming tonight. It was a wonderful conversation.